Today we're going to mix drums and I'm going to show you one of many ways to mix drums. And the reason for that is because I found a very cool multi-track to play with. So part of today's video is just going to be having fun and the other part of today's video is going to hopefully inspire you all to do something different when mixing drums next time. So let's get started. All right, so the drum tracks that I'm going to use are from the new human beat pack from Elusia. Uh, Elusia is a super high-end gear manufacturer, not only high-end in the sound, but also high-end in the build quality. And they have now come up with a human beat pack, which has 50 different already mixed and ready to use uh, beats. And these beats have been played by a real drummer, the human uh, Damien Kappenstein if I pronounce his name correctly. Sorry if I didn't. And it's all been recorded on Illusia Gear by Moses Schneider. And uh, I think it's fair to also name Ruben. You can see him over here, uh, the CEO of Illusia and the brain behind all their products uh, as well. Because I think they achieved a really cool thing together. Um, there's a small video on the website of Illusia. I'll link it all down below. And there is another video if you scroll down uh, called the Moses Schneider method uh, of recording and mixing drums and shaping drums. Look at all the Illusia gear that they have in there. All really cool. And the cooler thing is that the original multi-tracks so the original recordings will also be available as a separate purchase as far as i know you can purchase a single multi-track from a single beat and i have a multi-track in front of me here and i have one of these multi-tracks in front of me here this is the multi-track from the beat smile and this is how the beat sounds uh, in the beat pack so Let's move a little bit further. So a very cool beat and already hard to imagine that this was played by a human. This is not a drum computer. So it's a very processed and particular sound. Now there are multiple usages of a multi-track like this. The first one is of course to create your own sound and that's what we are going to do. But we can also use this to practice the mixing of drums. And I think that this multitrack is a very good example of how to properly record drums. Properly record drums. Like the way that these drums, this multitrack is recorded is something that I unfortunately rarely see anymore in my day-to-day -day job. Mistakes that I often see made is drums being recorded in the wrong room, so way too small room, and because of that you're getting way too much spill and not really a vibe from the room. Wrong miking. And another thing that I see often but is actually quite easy to correct, is uh, drums not being played in balance. I think because of the fact that we're close miking the drum kit that a lot of people think that we can fix things in the mix. But honestly, if you play very balanced already on your drum kit, it will translate so much better in the mix because your overheads are in balance, your room mics are in balance, like all the mics that pick up the whole drum kit are in balance. And one of the annoyances that I've been having lately with a lot of different drum recordings is basically drummers playing the hi-hat way too loud. But there are also being mistakes made with, for instance, a snare being way louder than the rest of the drum kit or, you know, that kind of stuff. Balancing the drum kit, in my opinion, is really important. And then comes miking and room recording and all that kind of stuff. And this is a very good example. And we will learn why. So let's quickly listen to this multi-track. I already have it rooted to the analog gear, but everything is now at least in a bypass. So we have a lot of different uh, channels here. And uh, the first thing we have here is uh, we have a kick that is recorded with a dynamic microphone and a condenser microphone. So this is just a kick soloed. There's a little bit of spill from the snare drum, but honestly, nothing spectacular. Now again, there's also a condenser option, which sounds like this. Again, here's the dynamic option. 
more spill, but I do like the vibe a little bit more from this one. So I picked the dynamic one. Same goes for the snare. There are uh, multiple choices and I went with the SM57, which is quite unique for me because I hate the SM57 and uh, this channel for the uh, bottom. So one of the things I usually do, it's I'm guilty of doing this. I start with listening first and then I look at the documentation whenever I cannot figure something out. So for this, uh, I'm assuming this is snare bottom. Like if we listen to this, sounds like bottom. This is top. And I just find this to be a very good uh, combination. And I don't know if this is the intended combination, but it is what I feel uh, is right. And we also have this combination. Has a little bit more spill from the kick. But, you know, I've chosen the other combination here. And again, because I don't know what is going on, I think I can judge things better. And only whenever I see a channel and I'm not really sure what is uh, going on and I want to figure it out, that's when I look at the documentation. And of course, I will take a look at the documentation after my initial li listen, just to make sure that I'm not, you know, forgetting something. Sometimes there's a part in the documentation uh, that says, hey, we actually want to use a drum loop mono mic halfway through the song. So then I, of course, have to mute my other channels and that kind of stuff. So another channel on here is the hi-hat channel that I'm probably not going to use, but I keep it in here muted because, let's listen to the overheads. This is one of those benefits of having a very well mic'd setup uh, and played in balance like I mean just a bit of compression will do it you already have most of the drum kit here that's how overheads are supposed to sound and spoiler alert overheads are not there just to pick up the cymbals they are there to pick up the whole drum kit at least that, that's how I like to use them so because it's already uh, so well in balance and because the hi-hat already sticks out so well in the overhead, probably not going to need the hi-hat. But what could happen, of course, is as soon as um, this drum track is going to be in a full production, that the hi-hat actually is getting drawn and then you need the hi-hat. But this multitrack is not in a full production. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> we also have rooms. Again, good room, very well balanced drums, very, very usable. Uh, there are also a few other mics that uh, come with this multitrack. You can all find them out yourself, of course. There are actually two setups that I wanna um, uh, highlight here, which is a mid side setup and how you need to use that is by um, panning the uh, front mid channel to the center and you have a side plus that you need to pan to the left and a side minus that you need to pan to the right but you need to invert the face of that and that way the whole mid side magic is going to work and this video is going to be too long to explain mid side uh, another notable mic in here is the periscope mic that they actually have gated I need a periscope as well for my drum recordings. Fortunately, I don't do a lot of drum recordings because my clients do the recordings. Maybe I need mics that I can send my clients. I don't know, new business ideas. All right, let me uh, quickly also reserve the toms because we might need those channels as well. And uh, yeah, let's just play a little bit with the analog gear here. All right, let's first see what we can EQ in that, in that bass drum, in that kick. So what I always like to try is uh, cutting a bit in the mid-lows. So that's around 200-ish. There we go. Listen, bypassed. Just makes it a lot, a lot tighter. Let's see if we can find a little bit of click. Now, we can of course choose to add some low frequencies to it. But is it really needed? 
Now, one of the things that I always have inserted uh, on channel one of the console is the transient designer. That's because I use the channel one of the console a lot of times for the kick. And with the transient designer, we can make the kick a lot more poppy or Again, it's, you know, the big thing here is what do you need for the track? There are a lot of things you can do right. And there are a lot of things you can do wrong, of course. But it, in the end, it all depends on how it's going to tie together. And it's basically going to depend on what your vision is for the song. And I actually think that the quality of mixing of, or production of a song uh, is more or less judged by the taste of the producer like did the producer have the taste that fitted the song anyway i am going for this drum track i'm going a little bit short so a little bit of sustain cutting and adding a bit of attack here and i'm also going to level it up at my output like that Cool. And what I want to do as well is I want to try to add some uh, compression to this kick as well. Just a little bit to keep it a bit more steady. The fact that we don't have a lot of spill actually allows me to do this. Um, what I don't like to do is first gate a kick and then put a lot of compression on it and oh, then, then so much is going to happen. So um, yeah, let me quickly patch a compressor on here. All right, I have the SSL bead-in uh, inserted on it here. Again, it's not just compression, it's as a change in sound as well. The trick here is keeping the kick a little bit stable as well. Like I don't, I don't want it to shoot through the compression in such a way that, you know, some kick hits sound really weird. I think this is it for now. And I think the best thing we can do is simply move on to the snare. I don't like to get stuck for a long time on a single instrument because in the end, it is going to be all about the mix and everything coming together. And what I have learned is that whenever I would have spent like an hour on just a bass drum, I would basically delete all those settings again whenever I would be at, you know, the guitars or something because then all of a sudden I would realize that I want to do something different. So for me, mixing really is an iterative process of like, okay, making initial settings. Uh, I think this is cool. Uh, let's layer something else uh, on, to on top of it and then go back to the first instrument, etc., etc. We're not going to cover that in this video today because I don't have the rest of the song because it's just a, you know, multi-track recording of drums. All right, so snare. And as I said, th these are uh, three channels. So we have uh, a mono uh, snare top and a stereo snare bottom oh that sounds really really nice actually um for snare i really like to of course um do a little bit of high pass filtering so we're filtering at 80 hertz here and i actually really like to add some nasty frequencies to snares like one kilohertz range and sometimes also a bit of the bottom of the sound not the bottom of the snare but bottom of the sound for the snare bottom the stereo recording i actually want to air that a little bit the risk here is that you are going to hear a lot of that um you know the snare the actual snares uh, rumbling on it so Maybe just add a shelf filter in here. This is like an analog hack if you need more filtering. Like that. 
Maybe. Just a bit off. Something like that. Add the snare, a kick. Cool. One of the uh, things that to me defines the reverb or the, I wouldn't say room sound, but you know, the roominess of a drum kit is what is happening on the snare drum in terms of reverb. And one of my little secret reverbs that I love to use on snare drum, but I mean, I really love to use the snare drum whenever I need to do a live gig whenever I need to do front of house engineering which I don't do anymore but whenever I needed to do it I actually took this reverb with me it's the Yamaha SPX 90 it is that one that one on top it's actually a very cheap reverb like if you go on eBay or something it will be you know very cheap unless a lot of people are going to watch this video and are all going to buy it because then the price will go up so don't buy it let me root it to there like this Like, you just use preset 2 and then you just adjust the reverb time. Now let's go, let's go pretty short for this one and that's basically because the whole drum kit is played short. Like it's a very tight plate drums. Ah, no, no, we're going to be a bit longer. And I mean, again, you can do a lot of things here. You can even uh, add a gate on that reverb return or something. Um, I can I can EQ, Let, let's do that. Let's remove a little bit of high frequencies. Um, from the send to that reverb. So that's on uh, channel 13 here. And I can just, you know, uh, do 15K minus a little bit. Make sure that those are off. Always wiggle these knobs a little bit uh, because it's a vintage stuff that actually has some, you know, stuff. Like that. Make it a little bit more raw. Another thing I can do with such a reverb is add another one and use my uh, plate reverb that is upstairs. It is on channel 15 and 16. And I of course need to turn it on first. And now it's on because you hear the... That's the motor that is um, changing the, the damper. Oh, maybe it's cool to, to keep it short. I don't know, I'm inspired to keep it short. One of the problems I have right now is I listened to what the people from Illusia made here. So that did inspire me. And that's, you know, inspiration is good, but not if you want to make something different. Then you don't shouldn't listen to the thing that you want to, you don't want to make. Anyway. EMT, a bit longer. Cool, and just for the pleasure of all the viewers, we're going to cut out that low frequency uh, noise. Normally I use uh, iStop RX for that uh, after recording it back into Reaper. And again, here we can also EQ, but I actually like to EQ a little bit on the return. All right. Overheads, um, let's solo them. One of the um, kind of issues I have with these overheads is that they are recorded so wide <laughs> that I'm starting to get a bit confused. Like I'm not used to having such a nice stereo field uh, in my overheads.
Like they're having the hi-hat so well placed on the right channel. So we're looking at the drum kit like this. If it's a right-handed drummer. Like the snare is exactly there. Yeah, I'm going to use these beautiful, beautiful uh, Neumann um, mastering grade equalizers and uh, uh, probably something, ah, uh, maybe a bit lower, a bit of, bit of grit, a bit of, you know. Oh yeah, and of course, uh, I can now cue the comments for the people that think that I'm an idiot for not screwing in these modules, uh, but it's actually intentional. And uh, I don't really feel like explaining this to people because people simply won't listen. So, uh, you know. The modules are not fastened in the console for a reason. That's all I want to say about it. Something like that. Cool. But that's not all. That's not all. Because I want to compress this. I mean... <laughs> it is so dynamic! <laughs> and I'm going to compress it with this. Um, these are both uh, self-made by me. And uh, today this one is having a bad day. Because that is what is happening uh, with equipment you make yourself uh, the right channel uh, is something i don't know so uh, we're going to use my uh, golly um, diy ssl type bus compressor vca compressor with the dbx vcas the original dbx vcas so um yeah let's uh I always like to overdo the compression so that I can hear what my timing is doing. And then dial it back. Like that. As they always say, glue compression. <laughs> I don't like the word glue. Maybe because the Dutch word for it is lime. I mean, who likes the word lime? Um, let's immediately move on to the rooms as well. Uh, and I want to make the rooms, uh, I want to do something special with the rooms today. And what I want to do here is use these uh, Brilliant EQs from a very not well known German brand. Uh, it's called ANT. It's not being made anymore. And what is on here are filters. So we have a high pass and a low pass filter, which we can use like this. Uh, that's a bit too much. Like that. Let's not do any other EQing. And maybe add a bit of that nastiness here. Like that. Cool. And then I want to do something that I didn't want to do. Because here's the thing, I always like to disclose, you know, uh, whatever is happening in the background in my videos. Like, who is sponsoring me, for instance? Well, I have a very good relationship with Illusia. We kind of have become friends. And Illusia did actually reach out to me a little while ago, uh, asking me if I want to make some content around this whole human beat pack. And I said, yeah, that's cool, but 
I'm not going to sell that beat pack. I'm just going to do something cool with it. They were all right with it, but they aren't sponsoring me or anything. And one of the issues I always have, uh, and I'm pretty sure that I cannot avoid this because people will immediately think that content like this is sponsored or something. Well, there's a whole different message and thought behind making this content. I just want to inspire you all and I just want to make some cool content and hopefully learn something to all of you. And if not, and if the things that I'm doing are actually more funny than serious, then at least you had a good laugh. That's that's my whole uh, thought process behind it. This is not to promote this or something. I want to use the Expressor Neo from Illusia that I also had early X to a year ago. I have made a review about it, which I'll link over here. But now I don't want to do it because of the shitty comments. And I think that I should never do or don't do something because of the comments. I uh, should do or not do something because it's the right thing to do. So I'm going to use the Expressor Neo. And just for y'all to know, uh, this channel is being kept alive by the community. So uh, how I'm doing that is by using affiliate links. They will be in the description down below. Uh, they will link to Toman, Sweetwater and Plugin Boutique. And whenever you need uh, new plugins or new gear, you can consider using my link to purchase that gear. You're not paying anything extra for your gear, but they will give me a nice little kickback fee from referring you to these shops. So make sure to check out those shops. And if you want to support me in a different way, you can also consider becoming a channel member. Uh, the link will also be in the description down below. And there will be a button somewhere down here. So yeah, you can check that out. Uh, and if you just want to make a random donation, there's something called a super thanks or a thanks or whatever. I don't know how that works. It's somewhere down below as well. Uh, anyway, I'm going to use the Expressor Neo and I'm not going to care what you think about it. All right, so here we go. That's why I wanted to use this compressor. Let's just use it on a very quick setting. Like that. Like just crunch it a little bit. Send it in a little bit with your original. I like that. Like just use it. <laughs> Not. Like that. Because now it really pushes up that room vibe. Uh, yeah. So the snare reverb here is something that I would actually automate and play with throughout a song. Whenever the uh, instruments would get a lot heavier and a lot more wall of soundy, if that is going to happen, then uh, I would actually uh, add more snare reverb, more drama, more stuff. And also this room channel is something that I play with a lot throughout a song. Like... You can add so much grit with this. I'm actually going to increase the high filter a little bit more, like... Make it a little bit more vintage as well. And we now already have a pretty decent drum mix setup. And of course, this is all a iterative uh, process. What is interesting to note here is that we started out with a lot of channels, but just because you have the channels doesn't mean you need to use them as well. So uh, yeah, uh, what I do want to add here just to make this complete are the Tom channels. Um, so what I actually need to do here is gate them because there is some ringing. You can hear. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to use the um, smart gate. Keep in mind that this is the first gate that I'm using. You don't always have to gate your drums. You only have to gate your drums if there are problems with it. But in this case, you know, there are some problems with the toms. Then I need to gate them. Let's 
see if it <laughs> it detects them all yeah and what I'm going to do is actually uh, render this to a new uh, track because then I won't have the latency that comes with a heavy plugin like this. You know, having analog gear, you uh, actually want to have, you don't want to have any plugins with, with latency. Same goes for the low tom. But always think about what you're going to do with gates and stuff because just because the audio engineering book says that you need to use a gate on something doesn't mean you actually need to use a gate on something. On the other hand, just because the audio engineering book says that you shouldn't use a gate on something, doesn't mean you shouldn't use a gate on something, because a gate can create some very interesting effects. And actually Moses is talking a little bit about that in his uh, video about the Moses Schneider method. I'll, um, uh, again, it, it will be at the link down below. Let's do it like this. This is a very, very short uh, tom. Uh, it probably is a floor tom and not a rack tom. There's a big difference between how a tom sounds that is uh, in a rack and a tom that uh, sounds that is standing on the floor. Super interesting. The next time you're going to record drums and the drummer has uh, floor toms that are standing on the floor, what's really interesting to do is ask the drummer to hit the tom and then lift it up a little bit and then ask the drummer to hit, hit the tom again and listen to the differences between those two. It's, it makes, makes a big difference actually. The first time I heard that I was super surprised about it. So let's um, root these uh, toms to these little silver EQs here. We're going to use channel three and four because I have a mastering chain inserted in uh, channel one and two that I don't wanna uh, sacrifice. So three, four, extra new track, three and four. There's actually already a setting dialed in here. Oh, that's a bit too much. So let's see a little bit of that. Bit of. I'm actually just looking a bit more for that tick at that. Yeah, that. Like that. Let's also do the low tom. And again, the low tom, very, very short. There's almost no resonance on it. So let's see if we can find a little bit of thickness there. Uh, maybe, no, 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 no. Like that, like that. And we can just use this to Thicken the toms that are already coming up through the overheads and room mics. Now, again, and I've been saying this throughout this video, like the reason why I'm mixing it like this is um, because it's recorded like this. Sometimes I cannot do what I'm doing right now because it's recorded differently. Sometimes I cannot use the overheads in the way that I'm doing it uh, right now, right here. What I'm going to do with these toms is I'm going to root them for now uh, a little bit to the snare reverb as well. I like to use the same type of reverbs uh, on, my, on my toms as on my snare because then your drum kit stays in the same room. However, I do normally separate uh, this recording so I make sure that I have a separate uh, reverb track of that. But for this video I'm just using it on the same channel, same track. So. And that is it. However, I want to give one more bonus because this video hasn't been long enough. And um, um, what I want to do is something that I regularly do with drums uh, in order to increase the vibe. Let's just put a washing machine worth of tape compression on it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, use the variable speed setting on here in order to basically EQ my drums. So the slower the tape machine runs, the less high frequencies I'm getting, the more tape crunch and stuff I'm getting. And the faster the tape machine runs, the clearer it sounds. So let's do that.
again, again, there is there is so much choice to make. Um, let's do a quick comparison because I have something cool in the studio. I'm going to put the tape machine on the fixed low speed setting. And then down there, all the way down there, that little red button, that's a relay box that contains like 96 relays to insert the tape machine or take it out of my signal path. It's a, like a hard bypass for the tape machine on all the channels. So um, let's, uh, let's quickly compare. So yeah, which version did you like? The one with tape, the one without tape? And what did you like about this mixing? And what didn't you like? And what did you actually miss in this mixing? Like, I can make a whole nother video just on bus compressing uh, this whole, uh, you know, drum kit. Because bringing this all together uh, on the bus is another thing that we can do. But I think this video has already been long enough. So yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts and comments. Uh, leave them down below. And while you're down there, you can of course check all the links in the description as well. Now, if you like my videos and want to see more, you can consider becoming a member. And as a member, you get access to a playlist like this one. Another thing you can do is simply watching more public videos. I'll link an interesting one over here. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks a lot for watching. Keep pushing and bye bye. And I had so much fun making this video. It rarely happens that I have so much fun making a video. Anyway. <laughs>